It is not transcendental. The world is not fallen here. Um, all the natural biological processes are a matter of fact, a matter of course, and the spiritual energies are flowing right through them. And the entire civilization is coming out of this. And in the love poems of Inanna and Demuzi, there are these celebratory verses of uh, fellatio and these wonderful puns where uh, the churning of milk and butter and the creation of butter is analogized uh, to the to the uh, uh, the mother's milk is analogized to the semen and the storehouse that stores the grain is analogized to the scrotum which stores the seed and all of these puns are worked into these texts if you read them they're intensely erotic uh, very imminental and Anna is singing love poems to her vulva uh, and um, um, but one of the uh, things that she does that's charismatic is she goes to her father Enki she gets him drunk and she steals the tablets that contain the maize and maize is just looks like the word for me she steals the maize and the maize are the sumerian destiny idea they're the sort of software by way of which civilization unfolds itself so she gets him drunk uh you know steals the maize that, that have recorded the destiny of the cosmos on them gets back in her boat heads off and uh, he sort of realizes it and sends these monster guardians to go fetch her and they they fail and so she's tricked him out of the uh, the tablets of uh, fate and she's very charismatic and uh, one of the other things that she does which forms the, the dominant text now is the descent into hell the very first descent into hell that we know about in literature is Inanna's descent into the underworld so here she sets a pattern that is later taken over by the patriarchy and is turned into the you know the ascent of Decius into the underworld or Christ as he descends down into the harrowing of hell or an Aeneas descending down to find the golden bough but the original descent is this charismatic descent into the underworld uh, where um, there are different variations of the text and it's very difficult to discern what the purpose of the descent is and uh, down in the underworld is Arushka Kal, who is her sister who is the goddess of darkness she is in the place which will later be occupied by Hades uh, the lord of the underworld Osiris in the Egyptian civilization but it's Arushka Kal, it's a goddess as lord of the underworld and she descends down in there and as she's descending down she has to surrender garments of clothing as she through seven layers that, and that's our key that this is linked to the seven planetary bodies as she's descending down leaving her garments behind and she finally has to forfeit her skin um, and they sort of hang it on a hook and she's dead so they have to go down in and fish her out and uh, resurrect her and then she's resurrected and brought back and there's this wonderful celebration now it turns out that the text is probably uh, an allegorization of the cycle of the planet Venus as it shifts from morning star to evening star I don't remember what the dates are for that but she is the planet Venus and at a certain point it disappears from the horizon and then reappears in the east and I forget what somebody here probably knows what the timing is but it's uh, like a couple of months and so that text is uh, uh, we've shifted from the world of the grains and the agrarian world this is still a very folksy uh, folk craft world uh, out in the shops and bazaars and into the world now of priest craft and the crafting of this world by priests who are studying the planetary bodies and beginning to analogize the deeds of the gods into these sort of planetary uh, events so that's the dominant text of the riverine mentality the climactic text is the Gilgamesh epic and the climactic text Thompson says always pushes this mentality as far as it can possibly go and prepares it for the transformation into the next mentality and in the Gilgamesh epic we of course get the absolute translation into the patriarchy now and uh, the Sumerians uh, gradually began to lose respect for the goddess and it's all very very clear in the Gilgamesh text uh, Gilgamesh sort of has this twin hairy cousin named Enkidu Gilgamesh himself is two-thirds God one-third man so in a, in a sense he's descended from it, the heavens whereas Enkidu is cooked up by the gods as this furry little beast uh, who's human uh, who comes out of the forest and uh, he's sort of hanging out lounging with the animals uh, and then uh, they sort of send this prostitute out to get him drunk and have sex with him and in a certain sense to lure him into civilization because Gilgamesh as king is sleeping with everybody's wives and they're like there's no equal in the city no, nobody can find anybody to check his transgressions so they appeal to the gods and the gods send Enkidu as his equal his hairy companion and this sets the prototype for uh, you know Han Solo and Chewbacca is the most recent uh, you know in Moby Dick it's uh, 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 what is it uh, Queequeg and Ishmael uh, where you always have the hairy companion the one who's uh, less evolved than the other one uh, in the Bible it's uh, Esau and Jacob and this sets up that pattern in a sense for all time 
And so en Enkidu goes into the city and he does battle with Gilgamesh. And of course, uh, you know, it's like we're seeing these things in our films now. They, neither one of them can kick each other's ass, you know. So they're equivalent and uh, they agree to a truce. And uh, so they become best friends. And uh, then they decide that they're going to go out and slay the, the spirit of the forest, whose name is Humbaba. And the interesting thing about uh, Humbaba is that his face represents intestines. The, the way he's drawn, and I didn't bring a transparency, I should have. Uh, but he's the spirit of the forest, and he has these intestines. And there are a couple of theories about why that is so. Why should the spirit of the forest have these intestines? And Herta von Dacian, who is the woman who put forth this thesis that these old myths were actually allegories of planetary cycles, suggested that this is uh, the pattern that Mercury makes in the sky, uh, which may or may not be the case. I think it's pushing it a little bit. But the other idea is um, something I didn't mention about Gebser, where he says that in the magical consciousness structure, the intestines are the primary uh, physiological aspect of the magical consciousness structure because they are labyrinthine and web-like. And you have a movement, as Gebser said, from the magical uh, with the intestines to the mythical, where the center of consciousness is in the heart, to the mental, where the center of consciousness moves up to the head. You have a gradual movement up the body through Gebser's structures of consciousness. I wish I'd remembered to include that. It would have made it more vivid. Uh, but nonetheless, this may be a link back then to the magical consciousness structure in which the labyrinth is linked with um, the web and the interconnection of everything. So they go out to kill this forest because they want to get this sacred cedar. So they go out, kill the forest uh, spirit, which is a kind of early allegorization of this deforestation process, and they bring back the sacred cedar to build the throne. And meanwhile, Ishtar um, has uh, challenged them, and she sort of wants to sleep with Gilgamesh, and he spurns her, completely rejects her. And she goes to the Lord of Heaven and prays that he'll do something about this. Send down the bull of heaven, she says. And so they send down uh, what is probably the constellation of Taurus. Descends down into the earth, this sort of gigantic bull, and the two guys do battle with it. And of course, they make mincemeat out of it. They rip off one of its legs and throw it at her. And they just sort of laugh at her and make fun of her. And as a result of this, she curses Enkidu with an illness, a degenerative disease that would be equivalent nowadays probably to AIDS. And so he slowly dies and wastes away. And um, this so moves Gilgamesh that he decides that he wants to conquer death. He must now go out and find out what is the solution to man's immortality. How can man defeat death? Surely there must be some way. So he descends out uh, and through this series of adventures. He goes off on his own. He encounters these lion beasts. He wrestles these lions and puts their skins on. Later, he becomes Hercules in the Greek culture. But now watch the animals that he's encountering. Uh, then he goes out and uh, to the sails beyond the sunset to the edge of the known world and encounters these scorpion men who guard the gates to the underworld. And he gets past them to go find Utnapishtim, who is the Babylonian Noah, uh, who he believes is in possession of the secret of immortality. Notice what we've got there. We've got the bull, we've got the lion, we've got the scorpion, and we've got Aquarius, the water man. These are the four cardinal points of the Platonic month of Taurus. And so they're working this into the text. The Platonic month of Taurus is, is about 4000 BC to 2000 BC. And these are the, four, the two solstices and the two equinoxes during that procession of the equinox during that period. So once again, as in the uh, dominant text over here, we have this working out of astrological symbolism within these texts by these very clever priests. And so he goes out, and the waterman, Aquarius, the Babylonian Utnapishtim, who survived all the world's great floods, tells him, okay, well, you know, if you want this immortality, you have to survive this test, and all you have to do is stay awake for a week. Well, now, Gilgamesh is the extroverted warrior. He's not a shaman at all. And uh, he sits down, and he keeps falling asleep. So the whole thing doesn't work. And uh, Utnapishtim gets sort of pissed at him and says, get, get lost. I don't have time for this. And the wife says, well, have some mercy on him. So they send him to find the plant of immortality, and he sails out to this little island and plucks the plant of immortality that he can eat that will make him immortal, and as he's swimming around, a snake comes up and eats it and takes off. And uh, that's the origins of why the uh, serpent is associated with death and birth. The serpent is the key in this tradition, still not a negative animal, uh, but the key to immortality. <coughs> 